Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I'm Andy Leach. I'm the Senior Director of Museum and Archival Collections for the Rock Hall, and I'm very excited to be hosting this conversation about Tom Petty's Wildflowers, which is a wonderful record that came out in 1994, and it's being celebrated in a new box set that was released in October called Wildflowers and All the Rest, which is right here, and it's fabulous. And it's also being celebrated in a new documentary called Somewhere You Feel Free, which features never before seen footage that was captured during the making of Wildflowers. And we're also celebrating the album here at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland with a new exhibit that opened in November. And that features instruments and other artifacts related to the making of the album. Uh, in just a minute here, we're going to talk about all of this with two members of the Heartbreakers, Ben Montench and Steve Ferroni, who played on Wildflowers, as well as Allison Tabble, who is the Tom Petty Estate Archivist. Uh, before we get started, I do want to mention that our museum here in Cleveland is open every day. So please go to rockhall.com to get more info on visiting and to get your tickets. Uh, we have a bunch of great exhibits here, including the Wildflowers exhibit I just mentioned, and that will be open at least through sometime this spring, so you should check that out. We also want to encourage you to check out our online store where we have a great selection of official Tom Petty and official Wildflowers related merchandise. And these items are not only available in our online store, but there's even more here at the store at our museum here in Cleveland. So definitely check that out if you come to see the exhibit. And finally, I want to mention that you'll be able to hear this interview on the SiriusXM platform uh, in the coming weeks, both on the Tom Petty radio and on Rock and Roll Hall of Fame radio. And as always, we wanna thank our partners at SiriusXM for all the great work that they do with us. So now I'm happy to introduce our special guests. First of all, uh, Ben Montench is one of the most celebrated keyboard players in rock history. He's a founding member of, of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, and he played with the band throughout its entire history. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2002 as a member of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Please join me in welcoming the great Ben Montench. It me. My hair's <laughs> not so great. <laughs> My colleague showed up. Oh, it hey, looks good. Woo, look at that. Alfalfa. <laughs> well, thanks for being here, Ben. Thanks for doing this. Um, also with us today is Steve Ferroni. Steve was also a member of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers for many years, and he played with the band from 1994 until 2017. Steve's first album with Tom was Wildflowers, and he played with the Heartbreakers from that point on. And Steve also hosts the New Guy radio show on Sirius XM's Tom Petty Radio. And here he is, Steve Ferroni. I don't have any problem with my hair. Yeah, because you don't have any. I barely got any, but... I'm very amused by this. Um, decided to be here right now. <coughs> Hello. <clears throat> well, thanks. Thanks to both of you. I should say that in, in addition to being longtime members of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, both Ben and Steve have also performed and recorded with many other legendary artists, countless artists, way too many to mention here. But uh, they're both legendary in their own right as well. So we're honored to have you both. So thank you. Also joining us today. Is we talk like that all day. <laughs> we, I will. Um, also joining us today is the great Allison Tavel, who is the Tom Petty Estate Archivist. And it's always a good day at work when I get to talk to a couple of the heartbreakers, uh, but it's even better when I get to talk to another music archivist. So in addition to being the archivist for the Petty Estate, Allison was the archival producer for that new documentary I mentioned called Tom Petty, Somewhere You Feel Free. And she also curated this beautiful new wildflowers exhibit that's here at the Rock Hall. Uh, and she did that along with the help of the estate, the Heartbreakers, and the Rock Hall. So, Allison, thank you for being here and welcome. Thanks. How's, how's my hair? You hair Probably the best of all of us, actually. <laughs> <laughs> ben, your hair looks great. Well, that's because I cut off the top of it. <laughs> A little bit of cinematography wisdom for you there. Yeah, yeah. China. Maybe I should do something with the lighting. <laughs> well, thank you all again for being here. Thanks for taking the time to talk about Wildflowers. Um, it's one of my favorite albums of all time. Uh, I bought it when it was brand new, and I listened to it endlessly at the time and, and uh, regularly since then. And I'm so happy to see it kind of having this new life and being celebrated with this new box set and the film. Um, and I'd like to start with you, Ben, if you don't mind. Um, as we know, Wildflowers, you know, it was it was officially a Tom Petty solo record, um, and and Tom started it with that idea. But um, it happens to include contributions from 
many members of the Heartbreakers. Um, and in some ways, it's almost more of a Heartbreakers album than, um, than maybe the, the one prior. Um, I wanted to ask you kind of about just your first memories of hearing some of these songs um, and just your recollections of how you first became involved in the record. Well, we were making a Heartbreakers record um, and we had started recording at Mike Campbell's home studio. And I think Tom brought in Time to Move On and I know he brought in um, Honeybee uh -huh. and a few other songs and we tried them. A couple of them showed up on the, the um, big box set, a couple of those takes. And we tried them and some of them were fantastic, I thought, and some of them I thought we needed to work on a little bit more. But I guess it wasn't what Tom was after. That's all, that's my only guess. Um, he was after something else. And Rick wasn't involved at that point. And then I was talking to Rick after a session one day or in a break in the session, maybe on this Mick Jagger record I played on that Rick produced. And he said, so I'm gonna work with Tom. I said, Rick, that's fantastic. He said, who's a good bass player? I said, Howie. He said, no, 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 we don't want to do that. Well, who's a good drummer? I said, Stan. No, we want to change it up. I'm like, okay. And um, so that's all that I knew. I didn't really think during the record about whether it was a solo record or I just thought it was a great bunch of songs and I had a great time. I was a little puzzled that the band wasn't all there. Mm. Since Mike and Tom and I were there, you know, I was a little puzzled by it. And... Um, but, you know, a bunch of my friends came in to try out and then Ferroni shows up and like hits the drum once and everybody's like, it's Ferroni. Yeah. Well, and yeah, and, Steve, could and, you talk about... He'd bring, in, he'd bring in songs every day and they were just fantastic. But the first ones that I remember hearing, I heard, I think Good to Be King even, um, at Mike's house before Rick was involved. Yeah. Um, Steve, you, you had at least worked a little bit with Mike, I think, uh, before this project, right? And, um, but otherwise, you were brought in for this album um, ha and hadn't really worked with Tom before, right? No, I had no idea who it was. I, I, I got a, I, I worked with Mike. We, we, I, did, I did a tour with George Harrison, mm -hmm. and um, we, we, we toured uh, Japan. And then George did this uh, add-on gig that was at the um, at the uh, at the Royal Albert Hall, and and he called me up and he uh, and he said, "Oh, I'm going to do this other gig. Can you come and do it?" And I said, "Yeah, I can. yeah, sure, no problem." He said, "Well, he said the only thing is is that uh, is that um, Nathan, uh, Nathan, uh, Nathan can't can't do the uh, can't do the tour. He was, he was, I think he was off with uh, to Phil Collins or something like that." And, um, uh, he said, is there another bass player that you like? And I said, well, um, Will Lee, you know? Hmm. Will, 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 I knew he was a huge Beatles fan. Yeah. And then, uh, and so we all came over and we, we, had, we had to go back into rehearsal again. And, uh, and, and I got there and, and Eric had been the, uh, the guitarist on the tour in Japan, Eric Clapton. And uh, uh, and and Eric wasn't there. Uh, kind of a bit of a strange, strange tour that, that one wasn't there. But, uh, uh, but Mike Campbell was, you know? and and I had no idea who, who Mike Campbell was at all until you know. And this guy just sort of fit in with the band, just just like it was like he didn't even really hear anything, any kind of. I mean, just he's he's the way that he fit in with the band like, right it was, it was incredible and then he took a couple of solos and it's like who the hell is I, 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 mike campbell <laughs> where'd you come from <laughs> and uh and uh and uh became an instant fan i mean we didn't really talk that much or interact that much and then this this call came for through uh, radio registry there used to be this thing radio registry that used to book musicians uh, people there and so we need to try find that and they had everybody's numbers and schedules and they said you know I, uh, you're needed in los angeles for a week. and i said really uh, can you go do a wedding session and i said who for and they said we can't tell you it's top secret 
well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that a big triple scale. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. And um, and I rolled up uh, to to Los Angeles, and uh, and they gave me the name of this uh, this hotel. The oh god, what's the name of it now? I forget the name of it now. They just changed the whole the whole place up over there. Sportsman's uh, Lodge. That's right, the Sportsman's Lodge. I'd never even heard of that. I didn't even know it was there. And, uh, and and so there, w- there wasn't really a clue. That, so, you know, somebody sent me the Four Seasons or anything, you know. And uh, I checked into the Sportsman's Lodge, and, and I, I got to say, very happily when I checked in there, I found that the girl that used to be the cashier at, at, at the Rainbow was, was the manager, was the day manager, who put me in, immediately put me into a suite, you know. <laughs> cool. And, uh, and then... Uh, and then I rode over to this studio that I didn't know too much about either, and uh, and um, and and Kenny Arnoff's drum kit was coming out of the studio, which is still not unusual because sometimes you get hired to play on a certain you know some of an artist to say I want this guy to play this track, and um, and uh, and so I uh, 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 I wandered in there and they were setting up a drum kit for me. Drum doctor was setting up a drum drum kit for me, and I walked into the uh, control room and I. Mike Campbell hmm. sitting next to him, Tom Petty, <laughs> and uh, there you go. And that, and that was in 19, 1992, right, not nineteen ninety four. Right. Yeah. The tour started in ninety four. Yeah, I was in the tour room too. We just didn't know each other. Uh, <laughs> I knew who you were. But uh, uh, funny, funny, I mean, the, I, we sat down and we started to st- uh, started to play. You don't know how it feels, and uh, and uh, that was the first song that, that we did. And, and uh, and uh, and we sat down and we started to play. You know, I started to run it down, and then we we did a take. And uh, and I walked in, and I was behind the behind the board, and they were at the front of the board, and, and standing there, Mike and Tom. And uh, and and Tom turned around to Mike, and he said, "Ah, oh, what a difference a drummer makes." You know. And I didn't know what that meant. I mean, you know, that could have meant like, you know, this guy just really screwed everything up, you know. <laughs> what does that mean, you know? And then Tom looked at me and he said, don't worry, you won. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, the start of recording the album. It was yeah. crazy because the drummers that had been in, like Kenny Aronoff, were all fantastic drummers. Sure. Yeah. But it yeah. wasn't what Tom and Mike and Rick were looking for. And Steve showed up, and they were just like, ding! Like, I think one snare hit. I don't, I don't think it really took more than one snare hit. They made you play the song all the way through. <laughs> I, th- I think in the, it's in the, uh, the Bogdanovich documentary that came out back in 2007 or so, where I think um, Rick, Rick says that it's that um, Tom no longer had to think about the drums. It was just, they were just perfect. And sat right in place where they should be and he didn't have to think about it as much as he had maybe with Sven, I don't know. Um, but um, I, I wonder too, um, it could, it's maybe this is more for Ben especially, could you talk about how just the approach to recording these songs um, was different than, than what you had done with Tom before um, or maybe just how you had worked in a studio before that? It wasn't really different than how we had all worked before until we worked with Jeff Lynn. Um, Tom worked with Jeff on Full Moon Fever and the Wilburys, and then they brought Stan in. It was Tom and Mike and Stan and Jeff. Full Moon Fever had been Tom and Mike and Jeff. They brought Stan in for Into the Great Wide Open and threw a bone to me and Howie a couple of times. But before Jeff, Almost everything, unless Mike's Mike's a genius, right? So we have a few songs where Mike would play everything and you program a drum machine, it'd be fantastic. And they might ask me to put an organ on it, a piano like jamming. But otherwise we set up like we did for Wildflowers um, and we just recorded. And we recorded in that studio, Damn the Torpedoes and Hard Promises and some other stuff. So what it was, was a return to the way that we recorded. Right. Um, but we hadn't recorded with Rick. And Rick had a different kind of focus than any of the other producers we had. A good producer is his, they're all different. 
Ivan was great producer. Denny Cordell was fantastic. Noah Shark and Jeff, obviously. Rick was more along the lines of what's in my heart, which is you just, you just count for and play the song. Um, but we had done that. Like, we'd always done that mm -hmm. before Jeff. Um, right. And so it was really welcome to me because that's what makes sense to me. Sure. Is to just play and play off of each other, listen to each other. Because you bring in a song and you play it on the acoustic guitar. You had demos for a few of them, but he didn't always play us the demos. He plays it on the acoustic guitar or on the piano, and he doesn't usually say, do this. And then you get to hear what you're, each other is doing and pull little things like, oh, Mike's playing this rhythm. Oh, Steve's doing this. And then, you know, sometimes Rick would say, no, let's do that. But if you're all playing at once, it's really alive. It's a living thing. It's beautiful. It's communication between yeah. the souls and the musicians. And uh, the well, you know, I, 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 being sort of coming in at that point as, a, as an outsider and not knowing anything really about how, how uh, uh, guys recorded, how they worked, when we when we sat down and, and started playing, I mean, I'm kind of used to being in a lot of different situations, from, you know, from being in the studio on my own to sitting in there with a full band, a full orchestra, and playing. It did, it did, but what struck me as unusual was the material. It, it 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 was it was different than what I was used to hearing from the Heartbreakers. You know, it it it, it didn't sound it didn't sound like anything. I couldn't really sort of point and say, oh, I'm playing with Tom Petty. You know, it all sounded a little different. There was something about it that was different, different for me, just in the songs themselves. And, and and then every once in a while during the recording, we play something, I'd say, oh, this sounds, this, here we go, this, is, this sounds like Tom Petty. We play, we play it for a bit. And then Tom would say, yeah, we've been here before, and throw it out. I'm like, are you doing? You know? I mean, it, it, it was it was years later, when, I mean, maybe even on the two thousand seventeen tour, when Tom really started to get into the Wildflowers and the rest stuff. That he said, "I found these, I found these songs, you know, that, that we recorded. It's a hit." Yeah. <laughs> like, I remember that stuff you threw out. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was funny. It, it seemed to, it, it seemed to have. It was. A, it was a. It seemed to me like it was a, a, a fresh. I wanted a fresh. I wanted a fresh start, and um, and and it was. It was. It was cool. You know? Well, very much so because the reason Kenny Aronoff didn't wind up making the record, to me, is what it seems like is that if you hear Higher Place on Wildflowers and all the rest on the big box set, it sounds like the Heartbreakers. The way the drums are hit, the drum fills, the organ the 12 string, everything, it sounds like the Heartbreakers. If you hear the one we did with Steve, it doesn't quite sound like the Heartbreakers. It evokes the Heartbreakers. It pretty much is the Heartbreakers. And it definitely is what the Heartbreakers became when, St when Steve joined the band full time. But they were looking for something different. And, you know, I salute them. I salute them. And Steve changed everything. And when Tom said, what a difference a drummer makes, it's really wild. Um, a different focus from the writer, a new producer and a different drummer, especially if it's as distinct of a drummer as Steve coming in after as distinct of a drummer as Stan, um, right. who's also an amazing drummer. Uh -huh. But they're so different and it changes everything because the way you play around it is different. Um, it was a more acoustic record than anything that we had cut since Hard Promises. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> Man, just terrific. Yeah. But the songs, good Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there was the songs, like you say, I mean, they they were different um, for Tom, even at that point. It seems like they were very personal and um, some were kind of autobiographical and there's a lot of self-examination going on in the lyrics. And um, I wonder, did, did, that, uh, did that kind of personal kind of approach, did that lend itself to not just uh, you know the songs in terms of the lyrics, but did that affect, I don't know, did it lend itself to a different way of working in the studio uh, or how he brought the songs in? 
Not really, not to me. Um, a lot of what he wrote before that seemed very personal to me. But he was writing his he was writing a little differently. I don't think and some of it was probably more openly personal. Like a lot of it's very personal, but you can go back to any of the records and you'll find a lot of stuff that seems like that. He just hit a new level on this record. So old songs that could be about anything or anybody like Breakdown, you know, American Girl, which is apparently about a specific girl in Gainesville. Um, but some of those songs, the waiting, all of those, you can find who he's writing to or maybe the situation or maybe you just came up with a, a hook. But if you listen to Insider, then that's a very, very personal song. Right. If you listen to A Wasted Life, that's clearly a personal song. Change of Heart and You Got Lucky could very well be extremely personal songs. But he found this collection that all felt really personal at the same time that he made a jump in his writing, in his form of writing. Yeah, it seems, yeah, like you say, it's like he's, go ahead, go ahead. No, like like the door, like like the knock came on the door and he opened it and just these songs just flew in. That's how it seemed. Yeah, I mean, it's, it really seems like that. It seems like it was a special time. And I kind of so Allison mentioned at one point to me how um, there seems to be more documentation in the archives uh, of from that project or from that time than from maybe other albums that were before that or since maybe. Um, do, Allison, or maybe any of you, do, do you feel like more was sort of saved from that time? Or was there a documentary being filmed about the making of it? Because, was was more saved because Wildflowers turned out to be a special record? Or be, was there a sense from the beginning that this was going to be something special? I would say the, the reason why the filming took place so heavily in that era was because they were making a documentary. Um, Martin Atkins came into the studio, uh, I believe just to make like an EPK and then maybe it turned into, well, I'll get some of the tour. And then that turned into him directing 400 days. And then, but you know, so that was a pretty short documentary and so much was left over and thank God they kept everything because yeah, there is quite a lot of stuff from that era. Yeah. Um, uh, I didn't really think anything too much about, about the, the cameras being there because you know, I'd, I'd learned about Tom through MTV, you know, so, so it was, it was, it was MTV, you know, the people started filming stuff in the studio, so people started coming, showing up with cameras, and my main concern was, that, you know, I think I turned around to someone, it might have been Martin, because he was British, and said, yeah, whoever's got the camera, keep him out of the way, <laughs> Yeah. so, so the, the, I didn't really notice them filming that much, you know, the, the, uh, Martin just had a way, and his cameraman had a way of, being there, but not being, uh, not uh, the focus for me was on the band, and that was, uh, 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 you know, I, I have to say that that it was it was the, the recording those sessions was really, uh, I really enjoyed uh, the way that the heartbreak it was the heartbreakers work because it was it was it, for me it, it reminded me of the like, average white band of working as a band in the studio. And, and 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 coming up with these songs and changing it a little bit here and changing that a little bit there and then and then finding the take uh, nothing making it easy like click tracks or stuff like that it was right. uh, uh, let's find this take let's find this performance and get the performance and uh, and, and 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 I really enjoyed making that album uh, so much so that when I got asked to, the day before Tom called me up and asked me to come play with him, well, you know, I, I just quit another band and said, uh, I, didn't, I didn't, I just really didn't want to go on the road with him anymore. And, uh, and, uh, and my girlfriend at the time said to me, well, you know, what would you like to do? And I, and I said, well, I really love the way those heartbreakers work in the studio. I'd like to work with those guys, but, you know, stands their drummer. And, but, you know, something to come up, you know, not, just go back making records. You know, I'm mean, back to being a studio musician for a while, and, uh, and then the next day, next day the phone rang, and, and she, she called me. She said, "Tom just called. I want you to call him." You know, uh, and uh, I, I should have bet on the lottery that day. 
dreams coming true. And I didn't even know. 20, 25 years of playing great music with these guys. Yeah. Well, I, I think, Ben, you say it in, in, um, in Somewhere You Feel Free, the film. You, you mentioned that Wildflowers always stood out for you. Um, in, could you talk about, you know, you know, the legacy of the album, maybe, or just what, in what way it stands out for you among the other records? Well, it sounds different the, uh, than the other records. Echo sounds a bit like Wildflowers, but it is emotionally such a different thing. And it was recorded in such a very different studio. It was recorded at Mike's house, which is very small compared to Sound City, where Wildflower is done, which is a great big open space. I remember the time really clearly. I remember the environment. We were very comfortable in that studio. I remember, you know, Rick, I was going to say Rick changed it all up in the sense that our first producer, Denny Cordell, was looking for the right arrangement and the right groove. And he knew a great song and he knew a great take. I mean, he wouldn't give it a lot of direction. He just kind of guided it. Jimmy and I, along with Noah Shark and Max, who were also engineering and very involved in the production, Jimmy Iovine came in from Damn the Torpedoes, Hard Promises, and Long After Dark. And he wanted to work live too, just like Cordell had. But he wanted a different kind of groove. So we'd spend a lot of time just getting the track to feel the way that he wanted and then the way that, and as well as the way that Tom wanted. And we could have added in takes. We could have had a click track. And I don't think it occurred to anybody. Um, Jimmy worked like that. Jeff's Jeff, Dave Stewart's Dave Stewart. But Rick would take us to where we would have gone, this sounds great. Like the Kenny Aronoff, the Kenny Aronoff take of Higher Place is fantastic. Rick would go, wait, what if we go here? And Rick would push us a little farther. And Rick would say, what if we do this little tiny adjustment to the second bridge or the last bridge, the last bridge in Good to Be King? He'd just go, Steve, leave the symbols out. He would find he would find something to push us a little farther away from what we would have done. Okay. Um, and I think it opened people's minds. And I think it took us to yet another place in, uh, in the way the songs were done. And Echo, Rick was also involved, but it was a different, it was an entirely different mood. It's just a magic time, you know. It's, it's kind of like 1966 when all the great music showed up. 1992, 1993, all this great music showed up, but it was in the room we were working in. <laughs> yes. You just um, thank you. One, one thing that Rick, uh, that has come up in a lot of conversations about Rick and Tom working together on this record was that there were no synths on Wildflowers. And I've, huh? I've had this conversation with Ben because a couple of my friends were talking about no sense on the record. And a lot of people go, what about time to move on? And so I was having this conversation with Ben and you, you said that time to move on at one point did have sense, right? It was just such an interesting story. Well, I listened to it again and the sense, the synth is there. There's a synth on time to move on. But what happened was we had cut it at Mike's studio before Rick was there. And I had a synth part because I was using a little bit of synth. I'm not dead set against them, just as a pad. But I'd worked out something that was pretty good at building and, about and moving the song. And what they did was they got Michael Kamen to do horns on it. And I don't remember if there were strings or anything. And they did pretty much exactly what I had done on the synth at Mike's house. And I thought for a long time that's all there was, but last time, last few times I listened to it, I went, that synth, because I played it live when we cut the track, that synth's in there, I'll be damned. So it's I, embedded in there, <laughs> that's good to that's know. It's true, you could ask Mike, you could ask Rick, but to me it sounds like it's in there. Um, just like they would say there were no drum machines involved in making Full Moon Fever or whatever, but then how come, you know, that, uh, I, that what you hear isn't a drum machine on those records, but it's not like they never turned one on. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bit of finesse. 
a little but bit. You said uh, you told me that it was the French horns specifically that did the transcription, essentially, of the synth that you had laid down. That's what right? it smells like to me, you know. And yeah. um, I'm, I'm I could be told I'm not totally wrong. But I could be wrong about some of it. <laughs> French horns, and it's gorgeous. Michael Kamen was a brilliant. Michael Kamen needs to have. You know, um, yeah, I think that they just kind of went, we don't want that on synth, we want it on the French horns. It's, great. it's funny, yeah, the, cr the credits uh, in the box set, don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't list the synth, it just says, Ben Montage piano and then orchestrated and conducted by Michael Kamen. So yeah. I I was also surprised when I saw that that there's no no synth listed. Well, I think there's a synth on it. It sounds like it. It, it really does. It sounds like there's one under the horns. Yeah. yeah. You know, maybe that's so they could say no synths. Yes. <laughs> and I'm not a big synthesizer fan. I really am. Right. <laughs> you know the the uh, uh, um uh oh god what is it uh you wreck me you wreck me. Mike came in with a demo of uh, of you wreck me, and he he just hit the hi hat like ta 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 ta, uh, and, and it was very even and just sort of looped that and and and, and so when I heard the demo, this hi hat thing is ch -ch 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 -ch, sort of chopping a hi hat so it jumped out at me, you know, and I said okay, well, when we sat down to play it, I I I I I, I mimicked that, <laughs> which is nothing and, that a drummer would naturally do, right? You wouldn't no, really sit down and everyone even like that. You know, they usually have like to tick to tick. I, think, to, I think that's one of the things they were driving Stan nuts with was wanting him to play like a Lynn Machine hi hat or rock. <laughs> and you just went, okay. I, you know. Halfway through it, the dang thing was killing my arm. <laughs> I'm like, not this. You're a miracle. You are a miracle. <laughs> it, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, can, can any of you just talk about. Uh, Maybe your favorite track or your, some of your favorite moments on Wildflowers, or just performance you're pr particularly proud of. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I, uh, there's, there's there's two that, that stand out out for me. Um, uh, you Wreck, you wreck me was, was such a fun song to play. I wish that we had got to play it more. more. It was it, I think we got that and maybe done two three takes. It didn't take long, very long to get it. It was such a great song. Such a great rock song, and 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 uh, you know the number of times that I was riding with my, my kids were going to school in Arizona. They were in boarding school in Arizona at that at that point in time, and and so we'd be out. I, I, they would be out in my truck, and we'd have the we'd have a we'd have the CD in the, in the CD player, and just blast and cranking. And you wreck me always. We make my kids just yeah. head back and way down. So it, it, it's something that that. Uh, uh, well, I always think of my kids, and my kids usually think of me when they hear it too. So it's a, it's a, it's a great it's cool. track. But the, the other thing that really stuck out for me was the very last track that we cut was what was "Wake Up Time." Hmm. And uh, "Wake Up Time" was originally we, he, Tom wanted to just sat down at the piano and started to play the piano and sing, and he asked, and, and he started doing. Then he said, "Steve, can you take a hi hat?" He had a vocal like a vocal booth thing that he used to sing in, and he, so I took my hi hat in there, and he said, "Just, just." Beat time and 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 play along with me. Just wow. so I just played, I just played, dun, 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 just played the player. And I, it was getting. I had to leave. I had to get back to, to New York. I had, to, I had a, 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 a date to do the next day and uh, to catch the last flight that I could help to, to make it. And uh, and and then Tom said, to, went in and listened to the track, and he said. What? If you were to put drums on there, what would you put on there? I said, well, you know, I said, I, I, know, I said, I'd just do a, I'd do a pass, I'd do a pass of it. I just made up as I, I, I listened to the song because it was going down, so I kind of did the song. Even even though I was just tapping the tapping the hi hat through the thing, you know, I, I followed Tom because he moved a little bit. But naturally, I'm not just going to stay stuck. I just keep the tempo and keep the feel, right. and, and so there was a couple of places that seemed like a little bit of a waver to me. And, uh, and, and I think I said, Look, "I, I got to go to, I got to get to the airport. I got to catch my plane." He said, "Oh yeah, okay, great." You know, it's just, it's, and I said, I tell you what, "I'll come back at my own expense next week and finish the third place." He said, oh, "Nice, it's fine, it's fine." Uh, okay, think about. It. 
And I, I went back to New York and I called up. They said, no, 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 eat everything that's good. No, no, you don't drink up if I do it, do it with somebody else or something like that. And, uh, and then the record came out and the track was there. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Such a pretty yeah. song. Yeah. Those little movements, those little movements just bring so much, I think, so much emotion to, the, to, to that song. Yeah. And, and um, it's just a, it, something that, that really do it. I, I, I got to give credit to Jim Scott. You know, I, I asked him, I said, how did you straighten out that? He said, yeah, I just massaged it a bit with, with the way that I mix things. He's massaged it. Yeah, Jim Scott was brilliant engineering the record. Amazing. He won a Grammy, right? He won the Grammy for it. I think he did, yeah. Um, yeah. Incredible. Speaking of yeah. wake up time, didn't wasn't the story that uh, the reason why? Because Ben, you're not on keys on that. Tom is on keys on that because he needed a distraction so that he could give a more organic vocal take. I don't know. We cut it with with the band. There's one on the box set that says it's with Stanley, um, and we cut it with Steve with all of us playing. But it just was it was more it was more personal if Tom played. And I, and he played piano every now and then on the records, mm -hmm. and I liked I liked it when he played. But it was really yeah, maybe he could give. Maybe he could give a more um, intimate performance or a more direct, without any interference of thinking about it, if he played the piano. But he plays the piano so beautifully on that. Yeah, you know, it, it, I the the way I played it was it just doesn't do the same thing. You know, I can't. Play the piano. <laughs> Arrangement on that is gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, so good. Like I said, Cayman's bloody brilliant. Um, um, ben, I, any favorites on of, on your end of yeah. on the album? There's a few because it's there are a lot of songs on the record. I loved "Hung Up and Overdue," which finally got put in the right place, um, and had wound up on on um, "She's the One," and I and I loved. Hard to find a friend. Both of those are Ringo, and I knew Ringo, and I love playing. The one I was going to say is "Crawling Back to You." Uh -huh. um, "Crawling Back to You" is Steve, and there's something about it. I don't really remember doing the take. I think I was like in whatever you call the zone because I'm Stone Cold sober, and I was then. Um, and when I heard the record, I was like, I don't remember that take. But I, I had because I overdubbed something on it. But it rises and it falls, and it seems like Peroni may fight me on this, but it seems like it picks up and slows down in little places that kind of go with the breath of the song. Because I like that. Um, it feels very, very human. It, the interplay is really wonderful, and the song's just gorgeous. Really, I think that you're looking for Ben is breathes. Yeah, breathe. It absolutely breathes. Which is something that I cherish <laughs> in a piece of music. I really <laughs> cherish it, and it, it really breathes. It's just the interplay between the whole band, the song, the lyrics are a little bit funny, a little bit mysterious, and very heartfelt at the same time. Um, it's just wonderful. You know, you know, I I did a gig the other day, uh, just a little gig with some friends, and uh, and and uh, there was this keyboard player. Uh, 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 a Ch his Chinese guy, you know, and and, uh, and he was the only player that I, I've ever heard play the to find a friend solo. Right? <laughs> huh. Wow! He nailed it. I was like, whoa! I'm glad he <laughs> did because I had no idea what I was going to do. <laughs> I just kind of did it. And I'm like, okay, I guess it's good. I <laughs> up and I'm like, can I do that? Even no, you can't do that. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there are just too many good songs on it. There's just too many really good songs on the record, but the acoustic ones stand out to me. And also, crawling back to you, there's something there. But I mean, Honeybee, <laughs> Honeybee is just wonderful, you know. It is. Down below is just fabulous. So you know, he knew how to write a song. He and Mike could write songs. They really knew how to write songs. Mike still does know how to write songs, and they they just. Um, 
they answer the, the right door at the right time or whatever you do. Why is that ringing like that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't mine. <my>, wasn't me. <laughs> Not me. It was Mike saying thank you for the for the right. <laughs> yeah. Um, Allison, I, I would love to talk with you just briefly about our our new wildflowers exhibit here at the Rock Hall in Cleveland, which you curated with us uh, along with our curators. Um, can you just talk about uh, how you curated the exhibit uh, about the album and just the process of choosing the right artifacts to tell the story? Yeah, it was it was a super fun process, but also pretty challenging because we had so many visual items that we could use to represent that era just because like the like the footage there's just a lot from that time period between the studio stuff and the touring stuff and the music videos and um and I had access to Tom's archive so that's where I started but then when it got opened up to being a heartbreakers you know the heartbreakers could be included I was trying to figure out what the easiest ask would be, I guess. And so I was like, well, drumsticks, those have got to be easy. So I reached out to Steve first. And, uh, and when I came to his place to pick up the drumsticks and the drum head, we got to talking and, and he was so nice and ended up offering the whole Dogs with Wings touring pearl kit, which uh, was really cool. There's going to be pieces of that on display. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, I got to work with uh, Scott, I picked up three harmonicas from Scott Thurston. And then I got to meet, or at least talk to on the phone, um, Howie's brother, Craig, who was so nice. And he was really honored that Howie would be a part of the exhibit. And then Mike was really generous and gave us that uh, 59 Fender. And the last person, to, it would come down to Ben, trying to figure out what, what piece could represent you know him in the exhibit and it's really difficult to ship a whirly or an organ they're delicate pieces and the rock hall just didn't have the room for that anyway and so i was going through all the footage i went into the clubhouse trying to figure out what we could get and i i found this um this rear view mirror <laughs> in some of the footage ben's like adjusting his rear view mirror on stage and i i reached out to ben i'm like what is this and do you have it and I love the story behind it. And Ben, you should just explain what it is and why you had it. and what. I, I don't know if Bugs ever found the actual one, but yeah. part of the show um, for a while, but part of that tour, I was playing with my back to the band because I had kind of a U-shaped thing of keyboards because I don't want to do a MIDI and different sounds. I want to play an actual, actual instrument. So I was playing with my back to the band. So I got rear view mirrors like you'd use on a motorcycle, or I was thinking of the Who uh, of Quadrophini. I was thinking of the Lambrettas and the Vespas. Yeah. And I had it attached to the uh, Vox Continental Organ so I could see Tom, I see Steve and Mike and, and Howie and, every, and Scott and know what was going on. It just So cool. It's such a good idea. Like, I can't believe more people don't do that. <laughs> I don't know where I got the idea. Somebody must, I must have seen somebody doing it. But I don't think I saw anybody doing it quite like that. You know, I couldn't think of anything when you asked me because I didn't know what the exact exact Wurlitzer was. I have several. The Hammond that I used on the record, I still use. So if I sent it to the Rock Hall, right. I wouldn't have my instrument to play, play sessions with. Yeah. And it's one of kind. And so, you know, the piano belongs to Sound City, and I don't think Sound City wanted to part with their piano. So yeah. what's the name of the that's Sound City. Yeah, yeah, Sound City's chiming in. Yeah, they're chiming in. Well, Ben, we have a, a photo of the whole band on display, and also you're you're there in spirit and every in all the pieces, you know. Yeah. Look, it's it's all right. I wish I could come see it. I'm a little leery of getting on planes um, these days, you know. Yeah. Well, um, Allison, just something you mentioned um, brings up a point. You you were watching footage of of the band when you when you saw that that rearview mirror for example were you to do this exhibit even just to to put together the the artifacts for it were you constantly sort of perusing the footage uh, to see you know what people were wearing what instruments were being played around that time yeah that's when we were making the documentary um you know i was just living in all of this footage all of 2020 had nothing else to do. And so um, just, I really learned that everything that Martin shot both from the tour and in the studio pretty well. 
And so when the idea came to do a, an exhibit with the rock hall, it was like, let's just go back to the footage and see what we have in the, in the clubhouse, in our vaults that I also am seeing here that could be represented. And there's a lot of clothes. Um, I took screenshots of all the guitars that Mike played and sent them all to him. It's like, which one of these are you willing to part with for a year? <laughs> and did the same with Howie's brother. And uh, yeah, just just started started with the footage and also then going to the clubhouse and going to our vaults and seeing what we actually what I had access to. Right. Very cool. Um, I want to talk about the the new box set, um, Wildflowers and all the rest, um, and just how enlightening it is um, for for people like me, at least, who, you know, have been listening to the original record for 27 years or something like that. Um, just, you know, through the home recordings that Tom made to the alternate versions and early takes, you really learn kind of about the songwriting process and, and the recording process, too. Um, ben, ben, you curated this box set, right? Along with Mike. Well, and... I, helped. I, I helped, you know, okay. I didn't give myself that much credit. Okay. And Ryan Elliott had a lot to do with it. Um, and Adria had a lot to do with it. And um, everything went past Mike. And I listened to everything. But, you know, the first disc Tom had already put together. You know, I think I made a suggestion about the sequencing. But that's it. And the rest of it, they just kept sending me all this amazing stuff. Yeah. Well, what could I say? You know, this is fantastic. Where's this been all my life? You yeah. Know, who knew? Did, did you learn anything new or make any new discoveries uh, that you can think of while you're working on that? Well, um, there was Angela. You know, I hear a song like that and I'm like, well, why isn't that on the record? Well, how could they right. possibly have passed on that gorgeous, gorgeous song? And hearing the demos that Tom did, the ones that he played for us had drum machines and stuff on it, you know, for a little drum loop to play to. And when they mixed it, they decided to take a lot of that stuff out to just make it more homey. But to hear the demo where he's actually writing the song Wildflowers in the time it takes to sing Wildflowers, right. that's really special. Incredible. That's yeah. really special. Yeah. Yes. But I love hearing the alternate takes that we did. There are some quiet kind of acoustic versions of Good to be King and things like that. That I can't figure what they were when we did them. Um, they have a similar sound. We may have done them one day when Martin came over to shoot some stuff on EPK. And we just played a bunch of the songs and played them with different instrumentation. Um, those are really refreshing. The ones with Stan are really cool because you get to hear the difference. Mm -hmm. but something like There Goes Angela, I was just like, man, that's such a gorgeous little song. What the heck? And hearing yeah. the fusion wheel and hearing the way that he was sneaking up on some other songs where he'd have a piece of bridge to one that would wind up in yet another song. Like yeah. I think, wild, do Wildflowers have the bridge to uh, yeah. the beginning or something? Yeah, they, it's, uh, Time to move on. Yeah. yeah. Is it the, um, the, there's a moment in, in the demo, I think for Wildflowers where he goes into that sort of that chord progression and that melodic thing that goes. Da, 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 da. And that, that ends up in hard to find a friend, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's all, it's, I think, I think I've got that right. But um, it's, it's really interesting, but mostly it's just that it's really good to, to listen to because it's a good batch of music. Yeah. So it's like, here's the dregs in this box set it's like wow here's all this really cool music it's, it's very know? rich yeah it's not it's not kind of like i know why they didn't put that one out <laughs> even the lyrics fly around on that, on that album. that's right the, that I work out never happened anyway that's yeah. on your yeah your tattoo that's right <laughs> yeah. which which was originally in a in one song and ended up in another, right? It was did it start in Wildflowers? Started in You Don't Know How It Feels. In You Don't Know How It Feels, right. wound up in uh, Crawling Back to You. Right, yeah. right. It's um, kind of true, because the ones that you worry about aren't the ones that happen, because you're worrying about this and then a rock falls from the sky. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, Steve, how about you? Uh, anything you've heard in these recordings that are on the box set that, um, that, you, that surprised you or that uh, were new discoveries for you? 
No, nothing really. I mean, listening to listening to to, to a lot of things and some of the things that that, that were redone, I, 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 I it's very understandable. Well, understandable. I mean, it it it, it just seems it seems. It seems like the, the tracks that he picked for the album are the right one. That's right. I mean, I, I can hear the difference in there maybe like a little bit of a ch- feel change, feel of something that changes somewhere in the in, the, in one of those tracks that, that, that be make it a candidate for being next. You know? Yeah. It just what he was looking for, the, the take, the take that he was looking for wasn't there. The ones that the ones that are on the album. On, on Wildflower's album, the takes that he was looking for. Sure. You know, that's why that album is what it is. And, you know, I, I think the thing that you can see in there is that the amount, you know, because uh, I know I know a lot of people just sort of think that musicians just sort of roll up and play. You know, they, they're like, uh, you know, you've got a three-minute song. Now come that it takes you like, you know, a, 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 a year to make, that, to, make that, to make that happen. It's like, well, because... There's a lot of work goes into it. There is actually, you know, the, the rock and roll lifestyle isn't just like it's an easy gig. You just roll up and start playing a song, and then it's a hit record, and then you walk out. There's a, there's actually a lot of work that goes, that goes into it, and it's a, and, and 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 rejecting a song for one reason or another, and start let's redo it and see see what happens when somebody else plays. It. Yeah. Well, we, and, uh, we spent what two years, ninety two and ninety three, for the most part. Worked two years record. Yeah. And if you think about it, in 1967, when the Beatles took a whole month to make Sgt. Pepper, everybody was, oh my God, they spent a month in the studio. Right. Um, but you guys were also trying out all these different drummers. I mean, one of the things that I found in the archive while I was looking for Wildflowers lyrics was this thing that I actually, Ben, I have a question for you because I don't, I don't know what this means. I printed it out. It's it's a tape inventory, but it's called Benmont's Secret. Does this ring a bell to you? Sometimes we'd be playing something. It might just be a jam. It might be a silly song. It might be something that might turn into something else later. And Tom would call it something. And he put my name in sometimes. <laughs> he thought it was funny. He told people at one point that the Hard Promises record was going to be called Benmont Goes Hawaiian or Benmont <laughs> or something. I don't know. I think he just kind of liked to tease me. That's that's funny. Well, the, the yeah, tape inventory is something that I had come up with, like an instrumental piece that I had come up with. Yeah. Well, Benmont's secret tape inventory. Uh, it's a seven page document that's actually incredibly interesting to me because I've I've heard Kenny Aronoff came into the studio um, and obviously Ringo. And um, I think someone had mentioned Phil Jones, but I'd never heard the entire list of drummers and bass players that you guys no. tried out. And it's in chronological order and there's dates and they also have what drummers and bassists you guys were using. He labeled the tape inventory itself, Benmont's Secret. Yeah. Well, I thought it was something else. I wonder if that's very <laughs> that's But so the the I'm just gonna read off. I wrote the list of of drummers and bass players because each one was paired up. Um, so Phil Jones and Bob Glob, mm-hmm. then Car- Kenny Aronoff, who didn't have a bass player listed. Right after that, on the same day, Steve Ferroni and John Pierce. So that makes sense. Hey, that the Campbell may have played bass. Campbell may have played bass. bass. When who Kim- was it? Mark- Tom. <laughs> Sometimes Mark played bass. Right. Yeah. So, so then uh, we had Ed Stasium, who mm-hmm. I, yeah. I didn't know, and then yeah. Russ Kunkel. Stasium's a recording engineer. Yeah. Oh, it said it said Ed on drums, but maybe it was Ed a typo. Green. Was it Ed Green? No, it says Ed Stasium. I'll send you this after. Um, okay. Russ Kunkel and Duck Dunn. Uh-huh. Steve yep. Froney again, uh, and Jerry Chef. Oh, that's right. Jerry came. Oh. And then finally, Ringo, what was that? I've been playing with his son, Jason Chef. Oh, cool. Yeah, right. Yesterday, I talked to Jason yesterday. Jerry Chef was Elvis Presley's bass player. Yeah. And Elvis had that fantastic band in Vegas. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. I mean, no names on this. Like, these are very famous drummers and famous mm-hmm. bass players. And then finally, Ringo with Mike Campbell on bass. And so, mm-hmm. in this tape inventory, you see the songs, or at least some of the songs that that were recorded with those drummers and bass bassists, 
which is just so, so interesting to me. I had no idea that there were that many. Yeah. Well, there, we, we went through a bunch, you know, we went through a bunch. And Steve came in and didn't sound like anybody else. Of course, those guys are all great and they sound like themselves too. But Steve came in and it was just like, Tom was like, yep, this is, it was like clear. This is what he, it's like when he knew the right take, he knew the right drummer. You know? Right. It's amazing. Um, it's amazing. You know, Steve Ferroni changed my life. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Feelings mutual, Ben. <laughs> well, since you, since you you've both you've mentioned Ringo and um, and Ben, you mentioned um, the Beatles just a minute ago. I want to one final thing I'd lo love to touch on for a minute that I've I've thought about or noticed for many years about Wildflowers. That's maybe been amplified now by the box set and the film is is a connection to the Beatles that um, that's there, and it's, it's especially the White Album. So. First of all, it sounds like Tom was influenced by a, a tape of demos that Rick had brought in that were Beatles demos of songs that ended up on the White Album. Um, and so I think that uh, that sort of influenced the way that he brought in songs or the songs that he brought in. Um, but there really are some other interesting connections, um, I think, to the White Album. Like sonically, there seem to be these common threads and of course Ringo uh was on was on both albums you know he was on at least on to find a friend that that um was in the album that finally came out or the, back in 94 mm -hmm. um just little things too I I wonder um if if you remember were the Beatles coming up in conversations during during that time that you can remember the Beatles we're always, if they weren't in conversation, they're always present. Any band of our generation, yeah, the Beatles were present somehow. Now, I think, you know, if you look at, I don't know, they aren't, uh, they aren't as present in soul music, but they're present. You know, Booker T and DMGs did make an instrumental record, Abbey Road. Yeah, Macklemore Avenue, right. But the Beatles were on the present, especially for the kind of band that we were. Right. And so they had such a huge impact. And yet you can hear some Beatley writing from him for sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and I feel like not with George, though, you know, so yeah, well, I learned, learned a couple of those chords. Right. I, I, think, I think I think maybe, you know, the thing that I found out over the years of working with the Heartbreakers was, that, you know, I mean, I, uh, uh, Mike, Mike and, and Tom and myself are the same age, 1950. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, we, we, you know, I was, I was sort of three thousand miles away in England, and they, and they were in Gainesville, you know. And 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 when we, when we sort of dug into talk, talking about stuff, never things came up. We were all listening to the same stuff. We were listening to the same music, you know, because uh, I know the, the, the English invasion featured heavily in uh, in Tom's uh, musical history and Mike's musical history, and I'm sure Ben wants too. No, like crazy. Sure. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we'd all listen to, uh, I, I, don't even, I can't even say like fans of, right? But we'd all listen to, we'd all listen to uh, a lot of the same music. We'd all heard, heard the same music. And, and, and that music had, had, uh, had had an impact on us uh, in, a, in a, I don't know, sure. around 12 years from being around 12. <laughs> well, I was born three years later than you, but we're still, we're the cats for whom the world turned into Technicolor when the Beatles showed up. Hmm. Yeah. You know, we really are. And the brand well, take on rhythm and blues that followed, that the Beatles started, that followed on that, the British take on rhythm and blues and blues that came back to the United States it was just, it changed the face of pop music forever, like the it's funny, used to say. It's funny. That, ben, but the, the, when you talk about the world turning to Technicolor, there was a film, there was a, a movie called Summer Holiday by Cliff Richard, which is considered a teeny bop mo movie, and uh, and uh, and it started off in as black and in black and white, and then this London bus showed up and the whole thing turned into Technicolor. Oh, that's great. And, and 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 so that was where that was where Technicolor, the, the world turned from black and white to Technicolor was Cliff Richard and the Shadows, huh. who were. Big surf, like surf music and blues, 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 uh, 
Yeah, you know, I, I listened. Song, I played a song of theirs on my show. I just played a song of theirs on my show. They were pop, considered pop back then, you know. Mm -hmm. But now, when you when you listen to it now, the, the, the blues and the surfing, the surf influence that came that came came from those guys, it, it was. Uh, it's really cool. I'm good friends with Byron Bennett, by the way. He's, he's, he's sort of that friend was, Facebook. The shadows were terrific. Um, Amazing. We, we did not hear the shadows in America. We didn't yeah. hear the shadows. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, didn't hear, we didn't hear the shadows. We didn't hear Cliff. Not 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 back then, like a few right. years later. But it was pretty quickly evident to anybody paying attention how good the shadows were. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, they're a really, really, really good band. Oh, good band, great place. Remarkable band. Just yeah. fantastic. Yeah. England, Britain, I th Ireland. I think all the Marvin stuff, had first, Wales. Hmm. I think Hank Marvin had the first uh, friend of Stratocaster in England. He was the first guy to get one. From what I, I heard hear. that too. I yeah. heard that too. Yeah. He had Buddy's glasses too. Yeah. Huh. Yep. Walking glasses. <laughs> well, it's just the um, Wildflowers just sort of also um, – I don't know, just even some of the, the playing. I, I feel like that tack piano solo you do, uh, Ben, on um, what what song is that? Uh, Find a Friend, I think. It's with the one with Ringo. Uh, it sort of reminds me of the Rocky Raccoon um, piano solo, you know, just little things like that. Um, I think I was thinking of Lovely Rita but abs at the time, but absolutely. I mean, they brought that music hall kind of thing in. Right. The Beatles nice. did, the Kinks refined it. Rolling Stones even tried their hand of it on, on their hand at it on between the buttons, but uh -huh. there was a specific piano that we really loved as an upright so much. We would rent it, I think, from a, a place called David Abel, and we'd rent it and we kept trying to buy it, and they wouldn't sell it for any price because they knew how good it was. They knew everybody would keep renting it forever. <laughs> Fantastic piano, but I was thinking, lovely Rita. Okay, uh, but also yeah. Sunny Afternoon by the Kings. Or as a dedicated follower of fashion, there was a thing. One of those. That you know, piano. And that music hall you thing. Right? You show up with that song, that's what you're going to play, at least me. That's the same piano that's on Hung Up and Over to Do. Mm, okay. Yeah. To listen for that. Yeah. It's, uh, the other thing is that uh, somewhere you feel free, I guess, you know, the, the fact that both of these, both Wildflowers and then, you know, the Beatles have this, this kind of new. Get Back film that just came out, which I assume, you know, a lot of people watching this have seen. Um, they both kind of remind me of each other in the way that they kind of pull the curtain back a little bit and you can kind of see the craft behind how these songs were written. And you can kind of almost see songs being written in front of the camera. So um, again, it's just another Beatles connection to the record that I noticed. Well, that's what I thought when we were talking about Wildflowers, the song and the demo where you just hear him writing it. You see in the Get Back documentary, yeah. you see Paul Wright get back, like out yeah. of nothing, start right. singing something and it just suddenly turns into Jojo was a man. And there you have the song. And it's they, but it's, what's wild is to watch them trying to figure out the words like sweet Loretta, what? Martin, and they, you know, right. yelling at the screen, it's this. Or right. like, we could get Nicky Hopkins. It's like, no, get Billy Preston. Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> you know what's supposed to happen. Yeah. When they finally make the right decision, you're like, yes, they did it. Um, yeah, Nicky Hopkins is great, but Billy Preston's the cat for that. Yeah. Right. Well, and, you know, Tom does a similar thing in Somewhere You Feel Free. I think he's singing the lyrics to, to find a friend um, and seemingly kind of comes up with them on camera. At this one in this one moment, uh, so again, it's just sort of a another uh, comment. Well, he he yeah. could do that, you know. He could absolutely write a song on the spot, and I saw him do it, you know, Amazing. more than once. I think everybody wrote a, a verse to to a uh, girl on LSD. <laughs> <laughs> I came up with a pretty crude one, I think. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that I was trying to figure something interesting to play on it. <laughs> a good one. Yeah. I stayed out of the what do you say to a drunken sailor type song lyrics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, if people want to hear that, they should go out and get Tom Petty, Wildflowers, and all the rest. Um, mm -hmm. 
Ben or Steve, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Anything uh, you wish I'd asked you, maybe? Uh, uh, one, uh, nothing. That, uh, I just want to uh, thank the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for, for putting on the exhibit. That's a, that's absolutely amazing, and I can I can assure you that I've had I've had so many. I mean, uh, a friend of mine who's a, is a cameraman for the uh, for the uh, for Fox Fox Sports and uh, was was there at the, uh, the Browns the Browns game, the last game of the season. And he sent me photographs from there, and other people have sent me photographs. A friend of mine from Denver happened to be in Cleveland, went to Cleveland, took me, sent me back photographs of it. Said, oh, you're in, you're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really cool. Yeah. Uh, and 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 I think that it's just amazing that, 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 that this body of work that, that, that I lucked into, <laughs> you know, um, uh, uh, that, that, that 25 years later can be released. And, and 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 I get, I got a beautiful gold album. Alison gave me a beautiful gold album. <laughs> I want you to know just how much I treasure that. Hmm. Uh, the, the, the time that I spent with the Heartbreakers was, was really special for me, and remains special, and will always be special. Beautiful. Well, th and thank you so much for your participation in, in the exhibit too, and and for doing this today. Um, and thanks for saying that, uh, Ben. Any any last thoughts from you? I'll second it with Steve, and I want to say um, Allison has just done yeah. a remarkable job. Just yeah. incredible. It's fantastic. So thank you. And thank you. Allison, but I, I win. I win. <laughs> <laughs> My, mine's growing, but it's it's never going to get to the amount of yours. <laughs> you guys, you guys. And these aren't even mine, you know, so. <laughs> I, I want to say one reason I think that record endures is – the no sense thing, um, which is mostly true, obviously. Everything on that record, for the most part, it's wire and wood, you know? It's just wire and wood. And some tubes and some ceramics rolling around. But it isn't, there's nothing, there's no digital instruments on the record. It's all what you call analog. Even if it's something like a Hammond organ that's an electronic gadget. But it's these timeless timeless soulful instruments and it's timeless sounds instead of the latest gimmick. I think that's the uh, vacuum cleaner going upstairs. <laughs> and so, and with, the, with the white album. The white album is wire and wood for the most part. And that's less timeless. Yeah. As are yeah. vacuum cleaners. <laughs> uh, Allison, any, uh, any last thoughts or any questions for these guys before? No, I mean, I just want to thank you both for being so lovely through this whole process. I mean, it's really special to to me to be able to look into this world and, and be a part of it in this way. And just, I mean, I think artifacts are so interesting and we call them artifacts, but really they're just, they're Tom's things. They're your things, you know? And um, and I think when someone passes away, those those artifacts change in their meaning. And when Steve and I were at the clubhouse pulling some drums together, you walked into the clubhouse and you go, it's good to be back, but something's missing. And that feeling is palpable. You know, you, you feel Tom's presence or lack thereof, you know, in these objects. And so the Rock Hall doing this exhibit, being able to be a part of curating it was a really, um, a, a real honor. I'm just really grateful that, I mean, it blows my mind constantly what I've been able to be part of a witness in my life, but to be part of this, this, um, this album and all of this, it's just remarkable. And that, you know, and that Steve came into my life through this record and Steve's really important to me, not only as a great musician, um, you know, and this may be off topic. Stan's a great musician. Stan is just a great musician. And for a while there was this vibe like, well, Stan's gone because he sucks or something. Stan's a great musician, but he's different than Steve and Steve is different than him. Uh -huh. And at that point in time, Steve was like, it was proof that if you let go and let God or whatever God is or isn't, the door is going to open and something right is going to come along for real because 
had we made the record with anybody else, it would have been a great record because of all the songs. But there's but Steve came in, and there's something about what Steve did, what Steve did, and brought to the focus of the music, and brought to a clarity of sound, or made people play a certain way, that really you know. That that's had a much greater impact than I think anybody recognizes. So thank you, Steve. Thank you, Ben. Agreed. Well, everyone, this was really fun for me. Um, like I said, the Wildflowers record has really brought a lot of joy into my life over many years and revisiting it through this box set um, and just learning more about it through the film and having this exhibit here at the Rock Hall and just having this conversation with you, it's all been very rewarding um, for me. And I, and I know I speak for my colleagues here at the Rock Hall when I say that too. So, uh, and I'm sure there, there are countless music fans out there who feel the same way about, about Wildflowers. So thank you all for your, your role in this. And it's been a true honor for me to do this. Um, Allison, congrats on the amazing work on the film and on this exhibit and congrats on the box set everyone and uh, everyone should check it out and everyone should come to our museum when you can and see this exhibit and Ben and Steve, obviously, please come whenever you can. And uh, we will, it's your house here. So we'd love to have you as well. So um, as I said, and, and, and that goes for Allison too, but she was just here. So. <laughs> I got to see it. <laughs> right. Um, as I said, everyone out there, please keep an ear out for this interview on Sirius XM's Tom Petty Radio and also on Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Radio. Uh, thank you for tuning in, everybody. And again, Ben, Steve, Allison, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Good to see you. Cheers.